1938, in the German Rhineland, a 10-year-old boy named Alphonse Heck was getting ready for his test of courage. He was cold, stripped to the waist, and surrounded by other boys. In front of Alphonse was a diving board, 10 feet high, above the town's swimming pool. Fifty kids stood behind Alphonse and the diving board, waiting to take their turn. And more than a hundred children stood around the pool, judging him. These were the older boys, the teenagers who had already passed their test. They were initiated, accepted, pre-approved. Alphonse stepped onto the diving board, and he looked out at the crowd. Despite the chilly wind and the eyes of the boys and the height, he threw himself into the water headfirst. When he resurfaced, he emerged to a chorus of cheers and whistles, and the leader of the boys, a 15-year-old, presented Alphonse with a gift. He was given a dagger with the inscription, Blood and Honor. This dagger was more than a symbol of Alphonse's acceptance. It was a symbol of the nation. The dagger was the Hitler Youth Knife, and it marked his official membership into the organization. We might think Alphonse was weak or wrong-headed to want to join the Nazi party at 10. But it might surprise you to know that by 1939, over 90% of the children in Germany were Hitler Youth. And every single one of them was indoctrined by using their need of approval against them. You're listening to The Reengineered You. This is a podcast about self-empowerment and all the myths, lies, and misconceptions we tell ourselves. Then we use science and history to bust those myths and re-engineer a better you. I'm your host, Todd Laments, the extrovert. And I'm joined by researcher, writer, and introvert, Joe Anthony. Good evening, Todd. Hey, Joe, I like our topic today, approval, one of my favorite subjects. It, one of my scariest subjects as the <laughs> introvert. Today we're talking about approval. Approval is a sticky subject in our society, isn't it? We all need approval. We desire it. But if we're too obvious about trying to get the approval we need, we can drive people away. How often do you see pictures of other people's kids on Facebook? Do you scroll past them? Or do you click that like button so you don't feel like a disapproving monster? What about when your coworker posts pictures of their breakfast, lunch, and dinner? Or friends posting pictures of their dog and cat? Or family members who spam your feed with political cartoons and articles? Do you validate their need for approval? Do you withhold it? Today we're taking a look at three myths about approval. Myths we love to share. Myths that demonize other people's need for approval. First, let's talk about the myth that children who whine for attention are misbehaving. If they really wanted our approval, shouldn't they clean their room or do something cute so we can post it on Instagram? Our second myth is that teenagers who do risky things for peer approval are morally weak. Maybe we shoplifted from the mall to impress their teens, or we smoked in the bathroom, or we drank too much at a house party but we would never join an organization like the Hitler Youth, right? Lastly, we'll talk about the myth that strong adults don't require the approval of others. Everyone is on an island, right? So maybe now we can stop posting pictures of our cats and our kids. But first, we're going to talk about how 90% of German children became Hitler Youth. Okay, so before we started this research... I was very much of the opinion that every man is an island and that your feedback means nothing to me. <laughs> you, not you, but you, the, the royal <laughs> you. Um, so this kind of changed everything I looked at as far as approval goes. And I kind of lucked into um, this story about Alphonse Heck. So Hitler Youth, uh, they were kind of like Boy Scouts. Except for they <laughs> followed Hitler and they did goose stepping and Nazi salutes. <laughs> yeah, that's that's not a whole lot like Boy Scouts, but yeah, right. Um, 
So the the similarity to Boy Scouts actually is that they had um, similar activities. They would go out and play war games. They'd run around in fields. They would train. They would they would learn how to survive. Um, but the way they made it the most popular uh, group for youngsters in in Nazi Germany, they banned Boy Scouts. They actually uh, banned their direct competition. And then they also started banning other organizations. And so they, they winnowed it down to where the only thing you could do in the German Rhineland was join Hitler Youth. So have you seen um, uh, the movie uh, Saving Private Ryan? Yes. Great movie. Yes. Uh, Won a lot of awards. Oh, absolutely. And there's um, the beachhead scene that's so gut-wrenching and hard to watch. And there's a scene in that where uh, one of these soldiers, the American soldiers, after they storm the beach and they're going through these bodies, uh, one of the guys picks up a knife and he says, oh, look, a Hitler Youth knife. And he, he's going to keep it. That's the implication of the movie is he's taking a trophy. But he starts sobbing. And I did not understand that scene until I was doing this research. What's, what's the significance of that? Well, I, I thought, and a lot of people online say that this is backed up, is it was just stress. That it was combat and him sitting down and being in a calm moment is what made him cry. What do you think? Well, my <laughs> opinion, uh, I like that you laughed about that. What do you think? Um, you have an opinion on everything. Here's my so conspiracy theory. Uh, <laughs> you always um, have an opinion. Right yeah. or wrong, right? Well, there, there was, um, there, there's a group of people online, and I now side with them, which uh, look at this, and they realize that he has just shot a German soldier, picks up the Hitler Youth knife, and realizes this German soldier is probably about 14 years old. Uh, that him carrying that knife means that uh, near the end of the war, when they were flooding Hitler Youth into the infantry because they were running out of resources and people. They're, just this, put, they're putting bodies up front, and some of them are 12-year-olds. Exactly, right. Yeah. There's a, a movie that came out last year, Jojo Rabbit, which is all about the Hitler Youth. And it's super lucky that we were doing this research and then the movie came out. And so I got to watch all of this play out. Um, there's a scene where they're like, like these little 10-year-old kids are giving them like a rocket launcher and telling them, go out. And it's, it's, it's played for humor. Right. Um, and it's, of course, they weren't that young in Hitler Youth, I don't think. But they were in their teens. So yeah. there, there is some truth to that. And it's, it's pretty tragic. But um, to get in... It was compulsory, but it was fun. That's something they don't talk about a lot in, in history books, is they don't emphasize that Hitler Youth was super fun, and it's everything little boys want to do, which is play war, run around in fields, go hiking, fishing, diving boards. So they weren't. it wasn't political, and it wasn't that they wanted to kill anybody. They were just kids that wanted to have fun. So then there was the, the what did you do after school? I did this. You need to come. It's great. Right. Camping, exactly. hunting. You know, using weapons, which is exciting to the little boys. Yeah, all the things that I wanted as a youngster, they had in the Hitler Youth, ironically. Guns and knives. and Yeah, it's exciting when you're a kid. It, it totally is. And I can see being suckered into this. And like I said, 90% of the youth were in this. Uh, there were um, competing groups. There was a group called the Idlewise Pirates, who are kind of little badasses as far as I could see. <laughs> Um, they went around and they would tag uh, anti-Nazi slogans and graffiti everywhere that they could. And they would find groups of Hitler youth who were really into it because some of these kids really uh, drank the Kool-Aid, so to speak. Like they were really into uh, the fascism and politics and they would beat up other kids, the Eidelweiss pirates. So they would show up and they'd like little in the streets. Wars. Yeah, little gang wars and stabbing right. and punching and beating. And yeah, they'd start a turf war. It, it ended pretty tragically. Near the end of the Hitler Youth, um, they ended up capturing and hanging six of the Eidelweiss pirates. So that is the, the real world sort of sad consequences that don't exactly fit in a movie. And 90% and 10%, it's probably right. They, they were out, they were overmatched just in pure volume too, right? Right, exactly. If an entire country is in this club, you can't exactly you know, beat them up every day. And all the adults. Yeah, and all the adults. <laughs> They're... Um, there's another scene in Jojo Rabbit which kind of struck me. Uh, while they're away at camp playing these war games, it's being um, taught by a, a goofy-looking German officer in the movie. And that is actually not totally true. Um, the, the history I was reading, the, the research I was doing, it, it specifically said usually these groups are being led by teenagers. Um, one of the smartest things the um, Hitler youth did, or the, the Nazis did, to encourage this, 
they had the children uh, policing themselves and giving themselves approval. So it wasn't that an adult was telling you to do these things. It was that your peers were. And that when you're a kid is so much more powerful because you look up to bigger kids and they're cool and you want to be, you want to, you want to get their attention and their respect and be one of the gang. Right. Yeah. I didn't want the approval of my teacher. I wanted the approval of, you know, the, the grade above me, the, the, the young boys. Yeah. I didn't talk to my parents when I was a teenager, but I, you know, I followed around the popular kids, the Letterman's jackets. Right. Know, puppy love in my eyes. Right. Yeah. What are the older boys telling me to do? Sure. I'll do it. Exactly. Yeah. So uh, another thing that struck out to me uh, or stuck out to me in this, it was um, the parents. So speaking of parents and their approval, uh, if you were in the Hitler Youth as a child and uh, you were, say your parents did not approve politically, you could report on your parents uh, as a Hitler Youth. Okay. So, that, so they had their, their feelers in that as like spies on the street. So they could have some little informants, some little rats in everybody's house, right? Right. Exactly. Um Parents were being beholden to their children to be part of the Nazi party, which is a very bizarre, you know. It really is, yeah. Yeah, usually politics works the other way where you get your politics from your parents and then you decide later. This was the the opposite. Um, almost like, like you said, infecting a house. Um, and the the children themselves, if they whined, if they if they showed their own mind in this, if, if they disapproved, they got beat up, like gang style. Um, I, I read about... Uh, Kids that, I mean, since they're all carrying a Hitler youth knife, what do you expect a kid to pull in a, a street fight? They stab you. Right, exactly. So they would just not only get beat up gangsta out, there was the constant threat of being stabbed by a Hitler youth knife. So most kids wanted to be there for the fun. And then the older kids ran the show. But if you got out of line, you got handled. Right, exactly. And so it was an entire structure of approval. That brings us to our first myth. Our first taste of approval usually starts with our parents, or under special circumstances, our caregivers. As children, approval from our parents warms us. It nourishes us emotionally, and it makes us feel special. We can probably all remember our mom and dad praising our crayon art, or telling us how good job we did on our macaroni drawing, or a snowman. Likewise, every parent out there is familiar with the words, watch me, which your kid will shout before they somersault through the living room or go tumbling off the couch. These are legitimate bids for parental approval to get the warm, nourishing feeling. But inevitably, children will try to game the system. At some point in every child's development, they learn to whine. And whining is an attention-shattering game-changer. So why do children learn to whine? How early does whining start? And why do children whine at all if what they're really craving is approval? So, Todd, have you ever heard of uh, self-soothing for children? Yes, we just let them cry themselves sleep. They pass out. Right. You don't run in there and pick them up and tell them it's going to be okay. Right, right. There's Red whole- face shaking in the crib. <laughs> There's people who are for it and people who are against it. Right. There's uh, two camps. And uh, I remember watching an episode of Modern Family where it shows them uh, adopting a child. And they're having to, like, hold back and keep themselves from soothing the kid. Cause, and they, it's like this big dude is, like, out in the hall freaking out because he wants to go in and soothe the child. Yeah. Um. I started into this research thinking that was the correct way to go. Like, of course, why wouldn't humans develop defense mechanisms or or mechanisms to cope with, you know, not getting that attention all the time? Like, why wouldn't you want a a self-sustainable kid, like a kid that can soothe themselves, that can that can operate independently? Uh, But according to the Harvard Gazette, uh, an article that came out in 1998, self-soothing can actually kind of cause PTSD. Oh, really? From a young age like that, too. Yeah, it, it teaches them that when they need attention or when they need you know love and approval, uh, it won't show up. It, it conditions a child to basically um, clam up because they feel like they're in danger. So it could screw them up emotionally for the rest of their life. Right. Um, 
I, I don't know how long lasting it is, uh, but but it certainly seemed to imply that it it, it was a, a lifelong issue. Nobody wants that for their baby, right? And whining, you you, you asked, you know, why do children learn to whine? Um, this came from the New York Times: uh, How children evolve to whine, which was a very fun article. I recommend it. Uh, it basically gets into the tactic of whining. So to get approval, uh, what I would do for my my parents is I would uh, try to draw things. I, I would come up to them with a, a very shaky, look like somebody with palsy drew a, an alligator or something, and I'd <laughs> turkey hand, hand, turkey hand, right, turkey <laughs> hand. That's a good, perfect example. Uh, and, they, and they would praise you for it, and you'd go away feeling you know warm and 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 giddy. And if it's colorful, if it's a good one, it gets on the refrigerator, and that's a big deal. Oh yeah, totally. Uh, I, I, I'm still posting things on the refrigerator, make myself feel better. <laughs> it's, that's my version of self soothing. Um, but it, it at whining. Children apparently learn uh, almost always at the same age that whining is cheaper and easier. That uh, they they have to put real effort in to get that turkey hand, and they have to you know use crayons, and they they go to the effort of putting a paper down. Uh, whining is instant, and you get the gratification from it instantly, almost. So you get attention, good attention, bad attention. Right. And, and your brain is similar, right? Is that what you told me? Yes. It, it's it's similar in the reward. Not as good, but it doesn't take as much effort. So it's it's the, the cheaper version. Um, they've also looked at uh, macaques, and they wanted to see if whining was universal um, between mammals. And they found out that uh, macaques, these primates, these these monkeys... Their mothers um, would react to the whining of their children too. So these tiny little monkeys would go up to them and start making these annoying chirping sounds, <laughs> and the mothers would uh, either soothe them or hit them. I'm laughing. I'm thinking of having that for alarm clock. You know, I'm on my phone of chirping <laughs> baby monkeys. It's gonna be annoying. <laughs> <laughs> so you you have a, a whining monkey as an alarm, basically. <laughs> And the, the fun part is, uh, this kind of reminded me of like, like disciplinarian mothers, that the macaques would respond quicker if they were in public. So like, like even macaques have the don't embarrass me in public reaction <laughs> to their children. <laughs> At home, I, it's okay. In our home tree, it's okay. But out here, where right. everyone else can see. <laughs> yeah, when, when we're alone in our own bush, like it's, it's, it's fine. But don't, do not embarrass me when we're out of the watering hole, or I swear to God. <laughs> um, but so it, they need attention, and it's it's survival for primitive mammals. The, the short and skinny, from what I could read, is um, attention for a youth of any species. Attention means survival. The more attention you get from your adult, your parent, the more likely you are to not perish from some disease or parasites or whatever. It's interesting. Uh, and we all, what about the adult whining? We all have those group of friends that get together. Right. And there's that one person who's the whiner. And I'm not going to say who my buddy is who does it, <laughs> but we all have that one. Why did they do it? They just never let go of it and it still works. Right. It, it's a, they were reinforced and it never went away. Um, <laughs> and, and parents. They don't even know they're doing it probably, right? Yeah. Oh, they, they have to. I, I suspect they have to. <laughs> they, they know what's happening. It gets real results. Right. So to curb whining, I, I had to put this out there. It's not necessarily a, a germane to our approval, but I could not talk about whining without saying how to stop children from whining. Uh, almost all the sources I could find online uh, that come from credible places, they say that you ignore the behavior. Uh, if your children whine, um, negative reinforcement, if you discipline them, is still approval. Even if you're like the mother macaque where you, you hit them for bothering you at the watering hole, it is still a form of approval. You, they, they got their attention. Um, so to so browbeating them in public doesn't work. Uh, right. Running to them when they whine, but it, doing the old ignore them, they'll stop doing it because it's not working. It's not getting a good or a bad response. Right, exactly. And you can still talk to them about it. It's not ignore them forever. Um, there was a, a doctor doing one of these studies called Dr. Um, Polderak. And uh, their advice was um, listen to them, uh, wait for the whining episode to, to be over. So you, you make sure they're not getting the instant val validation and, and gratitude they want. And then you tell them, and this is a, a quote from uh, the doctor, I love listening to you and I love helping you. Let's practice using our nicest words to ask for help because when you whine or cry, I won't be able to help you. 
I like that. I, I love the language. I it's like won't a mute button. It's you. like as soon as the wine starts, you hit the pause, the mute, right? Right. Yeah. Let yeah. let their episode pass, and then <laughs> and then tell them I'd gift. like to help you. I I I enjoy you being around me, but <laughs> I can't do that right now when you're whining. Yeah. These are all good strategies for dealing with toddlers who are seeking approval from their parents. But the need for approval doesn't stop at childhood. Teenagers look for approval too. And they learn, as children, that one of the quickest ways to impress others is to do something risky. So let's take a look back at 10-year-old Alphonse Heck on the diving board. To join the Hitler Youth, children are asked to participate in an act of courage. Jumping off a high dive might seem trivial to us today, especially given the levels of violence the Nazis would perpetrate in the very next year, in 1939. But for young Alphonse, taking the plunge with every boy in the town watching must have seemed like life or death. So why is he willing to take that risk? Why join the Hitler youth in the first place? (laughs) And how do we raise children to be immune to peer approval? Okay, so Todd, I have a question for you. Shoot. Have you, uh, when you were a young kid, did you ever shoplift? Yeah. More, yes. <laughs> I think every kid goes through that phase. I, I think the uh, first one I stole was like a, a gum or like candy or something like that. I think it gets bigger. Your trophies get bigger. Your right. It gets bigger as you get older. Right, exactly. So I was reading um, some studies that came out of Duke and Temple University. Um, one of them was called Peer Influences on Adolescent Decision Making. And the, the thing they found out about peer approval and specifically peer pressure and risky behavior, they, their studies showed that uh, peer approval didn't increase their risky behavior, meaning if they had kids around them, it, it would not increase their risk. But that can't be true. Uh, I mean, we, we already know that teens commit yeah. crimes in groups, whereas yeah. adults statistically do it in singles. Um, actually, I, I didn't know if you knew that, um, but children are more likely to commit crimes in groups. So they had to retool their study. Uh, they wanted to make sure that they were um, uh, testing accurately to make sure peer approval was being a factor uh, and that they discounted crimes entirely. They, they took the crime element out of it, basically. And they invented a game. Just riskier, risky, risky behavior. Right. They, they steered away from crime, and they went specific to just behavior. And to do this, they uh, got teens that were 14 to 19, and they invented a computerized chicken game. And it was a, a driving game on the computer. And the way it would work is they would drive around a track, and then an obstacle would appear at random. It would just flicker into existence, and it was difficult to avoid. Uh, and the teens knew it was going to happen. They, it was repeated. So they knew that these obstacles would come up and they would have to try to avoid it. The tricky part of this test, the, the part that they uh, didn't know going into it, is uh, the teens were being tested with adults. Uh, so like they, against adults, I should say. So they would test the teens separately. They test the adults separately. And sometimes they'd give them partners. So they would be driving and they knew that something risky would happen. And their speed and how risky they acted would um, change depending on if they had a partner in the car with them or not. It could depend if it was a grown up or it depend if it was a kid. It's. I'm glad you asked that question uh, because adults apparently did not risk as much with other adults in the car with them. Uh, adults have have grown out of. It's not so much that they've grown out of the want to impress other people. I think the I don't care kicked in with them at some age. <laughs> I'm not trying to be cool anymore. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And they found out that um, anyone in late adolescence that were driving with a partner became 50% riskier. So the, the need to get the approval uh, doubled their risk, whereas adults were the same as if they were driving alone. That's interesting. And the, the conclusion we can get from that is that um, adolescents are basically wired, hardwired on the brain to be risk takers. And they're um, not so much because it's like, uh, it's not a, an evolutionary joke. It's not, you know, evolution didn't decide to make teens you know, more likely to do something stupid in a car. 
It's actually because the uh, stimuli part of their brain, they're more sensitive to the rewards they get from doing risky things in front of their friends. So we may feel a slight reward uh, as an adult to do something risky and impressive. As a teen, your rewards are doubled. You, your rewards are much higher in your brain. Yeah, I think like with your your hormones and going through puberty and stuff too, it's attractive, right? Right. To be, to be out there, to be wild, to be noticed. Right, you know, to exactly. Get, to get that attention, to get that real approval. Right. It, it, and there's a lot of truth to that. Risky behavior uh, is a good indicator that you're, um, that you're good mating material, so to speak. Like a hunter. Right, exactly. A you're, protector. You're, yeah, Tough. you're you're bold enough to climb the tree and get the fruit. You're you're the hunter who's risky enough to go out and get the meat. It's a uh, it doesn't translate well to our modern days being in cars, <laughs> um, but it would have made you a good potential fit mate. But still inside, still in our DNA. Right, it's still, still hardwired in there. Right. So if I uh, act risky risky in a car as a teen, it's really because I'm going after a lion. It's it's not because I'm gonna you know get us into a fender bender. <laughs> Think about the age of Marvel movies we're living in. How many early adolescents did you see in Avengers costumes last Halloween? How many 10-year-olds would dress up like Spider-Man every day if they could? How many young teens would take Captain America's serum if it was real? We glorify risk takers. We make heroes of them. We give them adoration and approval publicly. Now imagine if all these posters of Captain America showed him wearing a Nazi uniform and he had a Hitler youth knife tucked in his belt. Can you imagine a 10-year-old who wouldn't jump off a diving board to be like his hero then? Are there any teens in America who would line up for that kind of approval? That brings us to our final myth, that adults should know better. By the time we reach maturity, we should have grown out of our need for approval. When coworkers kiss up to the boss for approval, it's repelling, right? Or what about our earlier example? Adults on social media who act like they need likes to keep breathing. Well, we may grow out of taking risk for peer approval, but the science shows that we'll always seek in other ways. This hits me personally because I can clearly remember as a teenager thinking that when I grew up and was a man and had a job and a family, I wouldn't be insecure anymore. But now that I've grown up, middle age, and I've got my worlds expanded, I have more things to be insecure about. I'm more ex- insecure about money, I get jealous, or my personal appearance. I really thought I would outgrow the need for approval. So I kind of assume the same thing too. I grew up as a, a reader of Marvel Comics. I was fanatical about Spider-Man and X-Men, and that taught me that... Underoos. You're the underoos. I was underoos, yeah. <laughs> and, and comics taught me that I also would grow out of approval. Um, but apparently that's not the case. <laughs> and we've known for a long time, too. This is something that has been around in, um, since the 50s. There's something called the Ash Conformity Experiments, and that's A-S-C-H. And they did an experiment with uh, groups of people in a room. And they had um, everybody looking at a, a chalkboard or, or a whiteboard. And they had lines on the board. And the way they did this test was they had uh, lines that were all similar or the same. And then one that was different. They'd have it be obviously shorter or longer. In fact, if you look this up on Wiki, uh, you can tell right off the bat by looking at it that the one line is longer than the others or one line is shorter. Humans are good at this. We, we can detect uh, asymmetry within like 95% or something. And what they did is they would have everybody in the room was an actor except one person. One person was being experimented on, unfortunately. And they would have everybody who's an actor speak first. And they'd say, are these lines all the same? Do you see one that's different? And they'd go down the line of actors and the actors would each say, they're all the same. They're all the same. They're all the same. <laughs> you might get what I, where I'm going with this. Yeah. By the end of it, when your, they got it, to the very last person. And it's your turn, and they're going to agree with them. They're not going to say. Right. Because they're, they're afraid that they're going to be outcasts. For, maybe they're wrong. Right, exactly. Yeah. Maybe I am wrong, is yeah. what these people would think. And they found that um, with actors, the incorrect answers 
jump from 1% to 37%. So a third or more of people would agree with the group because they wanted that approval because they thought they might be wrong. Something very significant. They right. They want to look wrong. The fear of, yeah. Right. And, and it's with one of the simplest things you get, literally uh, objective fact on a board in front of you. In front of strangers. In front of strangers. And that's how easy it is to sort of sway us for approval. Um, but there's also a, a study I, I found, and I want to preface this by saying that it only had 28 volunteers. So that's a relatively small study group. Uh, so it, it should be studied more or at least taken with a grain of salt because it didn't have a, a massive study group, which would be preferable. But this came from the University College of London um, and uh, Aarhus uh, University in Denmark, where they had uh, people who were being tested would listen to 20 songs um, that they liked, but they didn't own yet. Uh, and this is important because ownership implies that you're, you've approved of it already enough to, to want to have it. Put your own money out there, absolutely. Exactly. Um, so for them, they would rate these songs 1 to 10, and then they would show them if experts had shared their approval, if the experts had agreed with their rating. And of course, they found out that um, their, the reward centers of their brain, when they're put in like a, a test, uh, like a functional MRI, it would light up like a Christmas tree. So agreeing with an expert made their reward center go nuts. And that's, that's kind of what we see in the news today. Like, like if experts agree with what we already feel like we know. It makes us feel like geniuses. Exactly. I, I, that makes me feel smarter. It makes me feel better. That, yeah, those PhDs are my peers. Right, right, right. If these people agree with me, then I got to be on the money. Um. Now, there's, there's another one, uh, one last study I want to share with you. And it's about um, extroverts and how much they use Facebook. So uh, this one came from the University of Houston. And they were talking about um, how extroverts use Facebook. And they're trying to find out what is making them depressed. Because uh, they found that they had a very high amount of, um, let's say, needy extroverts. Um, and that, that's kind of where the depression came from, from what I could read, is uh, the needier you are and the more extroverted you are, the more you experience anxiety using social media. Because you have to check and recheck and, and basically keep on it like it's a, a resource you're farming or a job oh, you're at. To stay popular, to stay relevant. Right, exactly. This endless pit of tension you need. Yes. Of likes and hearts you need. And, and that is a, a perfect way of saying it. It's an endless pit of, of, of anxiety and attention because the two feed each other. And, and they found that um, if you need approval and you're an extrovert, it's a combination that means that social media is your kryptonite. And as, and as an extrovert, I've done that. I post these pictures and I want to hear how beautiful the woman I'm with is and how handsome I look. And I want to see all the, the notes. I have to check my phone every 10 minutes. It isn't the posting of the moment or the picture. It's the... <laughs> it's the attention afterwards if I have to if I'm being honest right yeah it's it's whatever I'm posting it's fine but where are those likes damn it <laughs> and why has this person not liked it when I've liked theirs before like, right like the one for one <laughs> right so if they you're an extrovert me. and you're looking for approval Facebook is not the place you should be going for it <laughs> we begin as children needing the approval of our parents. And we learn to whine and distract them. Once we realize approval takes work. As we grow into children, we branch out and we begin seeking the approval of our peers. Our brains become hardwired to take risks and to see risky behavior as a positive survival trait. This is why we can earn the group's approval by jumping off the high board at the pool or by driving recklessly with one of our friends in the car. As we mature into adulthood, we carry the need for approval, but the risk starts to slip away. We're left asking for approval with our hat in our hands. We find ourselves agreeing with others when we know we're objectively right. And we post social media obsessively, trying to recapture the moment when mom or dad tells us we've done a good job on our turkey hand drawing. Nobody is immune to approval. We all need it at every stage of life. And that you need for approval isn't a weakness. It isn't a moral failing. It's human. It makes you, you. But recognizing where you go for your approval can help make healthier decisions. 
This awareness can lead to less risk-taking and less anxiety overall. So remember, the next time someone asks you to agree with something that's objectively wrong, or if you're just feeling pressured to join a movement you don't agree with, remember that you're a grown adult and you have better places to get your approval. Thank you for listening to The Re-Engineered You. And remember, if you want to check out our show notes, uh, read about our sources, or argue with us online, you can find us at thereengineeredyou.com. We, yeah, I have one to say. Okay, good. We don't know everything, but we have an opinion on everything. <laughs> it's very true. <laughs>